Chag Sameach, everybody. I'm excited to be here with you for the feast of Tu Bishvat. If you're not familiar with Tu Bishvat, Tu Bishvat, if you look at it in Hebrew, what it literally means is the 15th of the Hebrew month of Shavat. In Tu Bishvat, what we are celebrating is it is known as the New Year for the Trees. Now, you might be wondering why there is a New Year for the Trees, and it's actually a very important concept in order to be able to properly honor different parts of the Torah. For example, for the New Year of the Trees, we have to know when is the when is the New Year for the Trees in regards to tithing and Bikurim, which is like first fruits of the trees. Okay, when do we know when the fruit belongs to the year we're in versus the last year? When is that differentiation? Well, we need a new year. The same thing as well in the book of Leviticus, chapter 19, we see in verse 23 that whenever a tree is planted, for the first three years, the fruit is what's called orla, meaning literally uncircumcised. However, it's, it's in the context of it being forbidden. One cannot partake of the fruit for the first three years, but beginning in the fourth year, you can start using it for praises to God, and then in the fifth year, it's used for your use. And so how do we know when the first year is, when the second year is, when the third year is, when the fourth year is, when you can actually start eating from these fruits? Well... We need the new year for the trees. And that's what Tu Bishvat is. So what we are actually celebrating right now is the new year for the trees. Now one might say, why does it cause for such, such celebration? What does this have to do with me? Well, we actually see throughout the scripture that man is compared to a tree. And we see in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 20, verse 19, The scripture literally says, Ki hadam et hasadeh. What the Torah literally tells us is, For a man is a tree of the field. That's literally what the Hebrew says. So the Torah actually calls man a tree of the field. You're a tree. I'm a tree. We're all likened to trees. Which is why whenever we come to the New Testament, what do we see Master Yeshua doing? Master Yeshua is continually comparing us to branches and to trees. There is a tree that is good, that bears good fruit. There is a bad tree that bears bad fruit. This is a continual theme that we see throughout the Gospels. Yeshua is calling us trees. We can either bear good fruit, we can either bear bad fruit. And we actually see in the book of Mark, chapter 8, verse 24, as Yeshua is healing a blind man, it says that the blind man looks and he says, I see people like trees walking. So this has everything to do with you and I and the house of Israel and the proper fruits which we are going to be going over today. Now one of the prophetic implications that we are desiring during this time of Tu Bishvat, it is actually very popular for, for ministries uh, to have a way for you to sow into their ministry so that you can plant trees in the physical land of Israel. So say you sow into a ministry, that ministry might have a connection where every dollar, every five dollars, every ten dollars that you sow in, another tree is being planted in the house of Israel. On a spiritual uh, plane, we are looking at this being more and more of us, you, myself, others that may not be in the faith, are actually being planted within the house of Israel spiritually to now bear the fruits of the house of Israel. We are all being grafted into the house of Israel. And so during this time we are praying for this right now. That not only that we would be planted, that our hearts would be planted in the house of Israel, but also that this would show by bearing the fruits of the house of Israel. Now how do we know whether one is bearing the fruits of the house of Israel or not? Well, we see in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8, verse 8, the scripture tells us the fruits that are specific to the land of Israel. In Deuteronomy 8, verse 8, it says, Eretz chita usora vagefen uteina varimon eretz zeit shemen udavash. It says it is a land of wheat, of barley, of the vine, which is like grapes, the fig, the pomegranate, a land of olive oil, and honey. Now, 
Whenever we're looking at this word for honey, the word devash, this is not honey that comes from a beehive. This is specifically date honey coming from a date. So today, rather than going through all of the fruits, because you can find so much depth and such great profound teachings on each and every one of these fruits that are found in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8, verse 8, we're going to specifically focus on devash, date honey, or dates. Well, we have to understand what dates represent. In the book of Psalms, chapter 92, in a Hebrew Bible, it would be verse 13, it says, Tzadik ka tamar ifrach ka erez balavanon isget. It says, a righteous person will flourish like a date palm. A date palm is where we get the fruit dates. Like a cedar in Lebanon, he will flourish. So we actually see that a date is representing a tzadik. A tzaddik in Hebrew is how we say a righteous person. So a date is representing a righteous person. It's representing one who does righteousness. Okay, Whenever you're bearing the fruit of dates, it's one who is bearing righteous deeds. He has now become righteous. Now, we also know from the New Testament that through Messiah, we have been made righteous. But we also have to see deeper context into this... Uh, into this perspective through dates. Now, one thing that's very important to know through Scripture. So, for example, we just looked at a date poem, right, where dates come from, from the book of Tehillim, from the book of Psalms, chapter 92, verse 12. But whenever we're studying Scripture, in order to have a even deeper perspective of whatever you're looking at, you want to look at where it's first used in Scripture, or one of the first places it's used in Scripture, because what this is going to do is it's going to set the tone for the rest of Scripture where that word is used. Okay, And so if we look in the book of Exodus, chapter 15, verse 27, this is directly after the song at the sea with Moses, after God has split the Red Sea and drowned the Egyptians, God has redeemed the people of Israel from Egypt. And in Exodus chapter 15, verse 27, God brings them to a place called Elim. Okay, and it says, Vayavo Elima, Vasham Shtem Esre Enot Maim, Vashivim Tamarim, Vayachanusham Olamaim. It says, And they came, the children of Israel, they came to Elim. And there were twelve wells of water and seventy date palms. And they camped there by the water. So notice that we saw in Psalm 92, we saw the date palm was representing somebody who is a tzaddik, a righteous person. But if we go back to the Torah in the book of Exodus chapter 15, verse 27, the children of Israel get brought to a place called Elim, and it says that there are 12 wells of water and 70 date palms. What does this represent? The 12 wells of water are the 12 tribes of Israel. What are the 70 date palms? These are the 70 nations that become grafted into the house of Israel. So we're actually seeing that the nations, the 70 nations, are becoming tzaddikim. They're becoming righteous ones as they are being watered by these 12 wells, the 12 tribes of Jacob. So what is this showing us? Is that in order for the date palms to become strong, in order for them to flourish the way we see in Psalm 92, it says that the tzaddik will flourish like a palm tree. But how does he flourish? Well, we have to come back to Exodus. Here, how are these trees flourishing? They're being watered by these 12 wells, which are representing the house of Jacob, representing the Jewish people. And so we're actually seeing that these, that these trees, these date palms, are dependent upon the house of Jacob. They're dependent not only upon the house of Jacob, but the watering of the house of Jacob. What is the watering representing? The watering is representing the teachings. All throughout scripture we see the water representing teachings. It's representing doctrine. It's representing scripture. So 
it is actually the house of Jacob that is supporting the Tamarim, the date palms. The date palms, therefore, are dependent upon the twelve wells, upon the teachings of the house of Jacob. And we see this in the context of the book of Romans in chapters 9 through 11. We see Paul going in depth, in great depth, with the Jewish people, with the fullness of the Gentiles, so on and so forth. And what he says to the Gentiles, he says to the Romans, he says, you do not support the root, but the root supports you. Now, what we actually see in context, he's talking about the Jews and the Gentiles. Now, sure, we know that Mashiach, the Messiah, is the one who brings us into the house of Israel. But what he's actually saying is that until the Jewish people take root, he goes, all of Israel will not flourish. He goes, you are actually dependent upon the Jewish people and they're watering you. You do not support the root, but the root, the house of Jacob, supports the palm trees. We see this in the book of Isaiah, chapter 27, verse 6. It says, And Jacob will come and take root, and Israel will blossom and bloom, and they will fill the face of the world with produce, or with increase. Notice what Isaiah 27 verse 6 says. It says, Jacob will take root, and Israel will blossom and bloom. We have to notice the juxtaposition here. Israel cannot blossom and bloom until Jacob takes root. So just as we see in, in the book of Exodus chapter uh, 15 verse 27, First, Jacob has to water the nations, and then the nations will be Tamarim. They will sprout like Tamarim. They will sprout like date palms. They will be Tzadikim. They will be righteous ones. What does this look like? It means that the nations have to come and be watered by the house of Jacob, meaning that they have to come and, and learn scripture from the house of Jacob. They have to learn the Jewish perspective. They have to learn the Jewish context of the scriptures. Otherwise, we don't know the context of the scriptures. This is the reason why Paul told the Romans again in Romans chapter 3 verse 2. He says, the Jewish people are the keepers of the words of God. And therefore, if we want to learn more about our Messiah, we have to go learn the context of our Jewish Messiah from the Jewish people. Paul says again in Romans 9, 3 and 4, he says, to them were given to the Jewish people, were given the covenants. And so we have to return to the roots of our faith, to the Jewish roots of our faith, and learn about the Jewishness of our Messiah, so that we can properly follow Him, so that we can properly represent Him, and so that we can walk as He walked, as 1 John 2, 6 says. And then, through our being watered by the house of Jacob, we will flourish like date palms, as it says in Psalm 92, 12 and 13, that the tzaddik will flourish like a date palm. Now, one of the things that we can learn from dates, my favorite dates are medjool dates. These are the ones that we buy basically on a weekly basis. Now, the thing about dates, if you look at their nutrition facts, two, maybe three, depending on what box you get, but we'll say two. Two of them is one serving. Not three, not five, not ten. Now, like I said, sometimes it's two or three. But regardless, very few dates. Two at the, at the most three dates makes up one serving. Now, if you go off of two dates or three, one serving has 33 grams of sugar. 33. So that means one date, give or take, has about 16 grams of sugar. Okay, depending on if the serving is two or three. One date literally has the amount of sugar to sweeten the entire meal. Or better yet, for some people, to sweeten the entire day. If we're each likened to a date palm and we're to bear the fruits of dates, what can we take from this? If we desire to be the righteous ones in the image of the Messiah, walking in His image, bearing His fruits, and bearing His image to all creation, what does this tell us? 
Well, if one date can sweeten your entire meal, if one date can even perhaps sweeten your entire day, how much more can one sadiq, can one righteous person change his entire surrounding? How much can one sadiq influence his household? How much can one sadiq influence his family? How much can one sadiq influence his neighborhood, his school, his workplace, his whole ministry? The book of Proverbs in Proverbs 10.25 says, Tzadik Yasod Olam. It says that Tzadik is the foundation of the world. And right before this it says the wicked perish and are no more, but that Tzadik is the foundation of the world. Where are we really getting this scripture from? From the book of Genesis with Noah. All of the wicked were washed out by the flood. And because of one Tzadik, because of Noah, the entire world was sustained and made new. This is what we can learn from the dates today. Is that you and I, through the righteous Messiah, Yeshua himself, and being properly watered, learning how to properly follow the Messiah, through learning the Jewish context of, our, of, of the scriptures, and being watered by the house of Jacob, you and I, can change our surroundings, we can change our households, we can change our families, we can change our friends, we can change all those that are around us. So during Tu Bishvat, the new year of the trees, may we bear the fruits of the house of Israel. Shalom and Chag Sameach.